I hope someday they invent a burrito that salsas itself. Um. Until then, driving a stick and eating a burrito will continue to be quite complicated. You know how sometimes people randomly roll up and mess up your car? Well, I'm gonna do the opposite of that. This thing's looking pretty good. Um, it's not exactly done. I'm supposed to drive to Plymouth in like three days, so I'm gonna try and help, I guess. Ooh, giant Cummins. That toolbox oh, is so cute. Right, how's it going? Uh, I don't know, not bad. I'm running out of parts to put on the Fury. I remember these. I also hate them. It's already almost done. Well, okay. There's something really funny about this. So here's the deal. This guy's gonna drive this car like 6,000 miles or more. And for some reason he's greedy and he wants a working fuel gauge. Huh, there's something missing. What a disappointment. Anyway, a working fuel gauge is a luxury that most classic Mopar owners don't get to enjoy. I've actually done a whole video on this subject, which you can go check out, but uh, I'm gonna dive into this one, see if we can't diagnose what's wrong and maybe possibly fix it. To do this, I've got my old friend, the Power Probe. Well, this one's not actually mine. And this kit is way too nice. Apparently these guys have a service truck, which, yeah, jealous, but it obviously runs perfect and makes smells. So that's delightful. I still can't believe he has a nice battery hold down. Now I've spent a lot of time on the channel extolling the virtues of the power probe. If you're gonna do much electrical work, you need one of these things. They can output 12 volts, a ground, and actually the fancier ones can do lower like sensor level voltages too, which is cool. And it's so fancy. And by fancy, I mean like super basic, but it never worked before. Well, first things first, I checked for a fuse that powers the gauge cluster. I'm pretty sure there should be one, but there isn't one labeled to do so. All the fuses seem to be fine, except for one that's not in, which is actually for the radio. But for science, I came up to the back of the cluster. This 64 car actually has the separate voltage limiter instead of the built into the gas gauge type, which is found in a lot of cars of this vintage. There's no power going to it. So I've got the power probe up under the dash. And if I put power to it, this happens. Yeah. And it just kind of keeps going. Neat, so that might be a bad sending unit for the coolant gauge, or that wire's grounded out, but the fuel gauge never moved. Obviously we need to get power going to this limiter before we can figure out anything further. That five volt limiter, which in this case is a fancy electronic one, mounted up there and wired with purple, red, and that weird brown color, powers the fuel gauge and the temperature gauge. It kind of seems like either those wires are touching, putting full 12 volts to that temp gauge, or there's another problem. And we'll get to that soon, but first, we need power coming here. Oh. My. God. You know, I knew this cowl was bad, but that's terrifying. Suddenly it's pouring rain, and I'm getting wet. Future project? The green one. Although I'd really like the blue one too. All right, question answered. Remember when I was like, maybe the wire's grounded out. Yeah, it's just sitting on the intake. All right, that's with power jump to it now, so either it's actually cold or the sending unit's bad. Okay, I figured out problem one, no power. That black wire on the far left of that plug right there connects into that trail, which wraps down to the middle connection for the volt limiter. And that trail is broken right behind that gauge stud, so you can't see it. Now that's a good one. Circuit board problems here are also relatively common. Now that I've replaced the missing radio fuse, there's an extra accessory connection on the back here that I can use to now power the gauges. I could just patch the wiring behind the dash, but there's not much room and I don't feel like it. So I've got a wire here that'll work fine. I think that extra wire powers the rear speaker amplifier thingy in the trunk. Huge, crazy vintage stereo equipment that doesn't work anyway. I'm so surprised this doesn't work. I'd be surprised if it's even plugged in. It is interesting that the black key circuit wire here that I just powered up is not the wire that powers the gauges. I still don't know where that comes from. Oh, well, maybe it's that one. Anyway, moving on. I'm gonna put a wire on that pin there and then run it over to the back of the gauges and we'll see what we get. Should I be worried about the fact that I'm watching it rain inside the car right now? Yeah. 
Okay, with that wire run to the fuse panel and the key turned on, I've now got the probe on the output of that little limiter. And it's 5.1, which is close enough. Now we've been using these electronic style five volt limiters for this for years. Of course, this input is supposed to be more like six or seven volts. So the gauges will tend to read a little bit low, but a fuel gauge that does something is much better than a fuel gauge that does absolutely nothing, I think. Oh man, well, I've got, you, you can't see anything, I apologize. We've got five volts to the power input stud on the fuel gauge right here. Now, if the gauge were good inside, I could move the probe over to the other side, the signal side, and we would see that same five volt signal. But we don't, so that's unfortunate. The gauge is bad. Now, this is funny too. I'm not getting a beeping here from the grounding through the sending unit, but up here I am, and that means this trail is broken too. Where is it? Yeah, I mean, it reads there, but not, oh, here it is. Yeah, it's just a crappy connection through the nut. But again, unfortunately, this has to be a broken circuit inside the gauge, or right here on the stud, I would see the same five volt signal. So what we have here is a good temperature gauge and a bad fuel gauge. I might have just had the best idea ever. Testing. Okay. Okay. Maybe. Yes. I did some quick research on the internet trying to figure out if the resistance range for the coolant gauge is the same as the gas gauge. Several sources said it was not. One source said yes. So I thought it was worth a try. This is the output from the sending unit in the tank jumped to the input side of the temperature gauge. And what do you know? It works. Now I cannot speak to how accurate this is. It sounds like there's a pretty full fuel tank back there, but my brother's off driving a Chevy HHR or something, so I can't exactly confirm that. And of course, I've gone ahead and destroyed what otherwise probably would have been a working temp gauge, but the thing is, he's got one of these goofy triple pod things anyway. So, I think this is a net positive. Mmm, lunch. Ah, mmm, dessert. Mmm, not bad. I need masking tape. Any good Mopar guy keeps a few of these in his toolbox. Oh yeah. Yeah, I feel good about that. It's pretty much fully restored. That's eh, better from this angle. Well, there you go, secret life hack. If your temperature gauge is not important and you really, really want a fuel gauge, of course, you also need to have a sending unit and wires and a limiter that work, there's a good way to get one. Okay, honestly, the only reason I'm even doing this is because I was supposed to look for a good gas gauge before I left Rocket this week and, well, I forgot. How cool is the 64 Plymouth Cluster? It's awesome. Oh, and admire the push button delete plate too. This was an original push button automatic car. Oh, that reminds me. Several commenters noticed when the floor was out of this car that the slip yoke sticks way far out of the transmission. Yeah, we're aware. It's held up so far. It's been that way for like eight years. I'm pretty sure it's fine. Someday I'll try and fix a clock. But today is not that day. You know, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know why I was questioning the resistance range for the gauges. I know they're the same because I know that the Chrysler gauge tester exists. It works. I'm pleased. Oh, I don't think I showed this. So here's the actual connection I made to make this work. I just jumped the signal sides of both gauges together after tightening down that nut there so it would actually be reading. And I re-disconnected the temperature probe as well. This is so, so bad. <sighs> I get my jump box got wet again. It's not gonna be long till it starts screaming. A few more things have happened with this car since the end of the floor replacement video. For one thing, I don't think he got to the carpet. It's in, um, expertly trimmed as you can see. It's looking pretty good in here. Oh, we did change the bench seat tracks on this bench seat. It's still terrible, but it's a little better. For some unknown reason, it has a meet me porn now, which currently doesn't work. I did try and get him to install a gigantic longhorn out of one of my 50s Plymouths, but no. The car has been highway tested again, and it seems to work, which is good because again, 6,000 mile road trip in like two or three days. 
I imagine this is the last we'll see of the Fury before like it gets back from Plymouth. So um, yeah, take a good long look now because there's always a chance it won't make it back. But don't let him hear me say that. Is that your new whip? I hope not. Is it restored or what? Uh, you could say that. Okay. You have a gas gauge. Okay, does it say temperature? No, it says gas now. What did you do? Colin's been talking about this Plymouth to Plymouth road trip for like years. Frankly, I'm amazed it's actually happening, but yeah, perseverance and hard work pay off, I guess. If you want to keep tabs on his day-to-day -day exploits in the uh, 64 Fury here on his Plymouth and a Plymouth road trip, go follow him on Instagram. His handle is 273duster. That's 273 underscore duster. He'll probably be posting there daily-ish. that horrible noise. Ugh. Anyway, he changed the carburetor and timed it as well and it, it seems to run pretty well, so that's good. Should I do some big smoky burnouts in their parking lot or what? Now I got lucky on this one because the sending unit in the tank is good. Again, go refer to my first fuel gauge diagnosis and repair video for more thorough tips on testing and how these circuits work. This was just kind of a quick diagnosis run through. And another look at the 64 Fury. People seem to like the 64 Fury. If you do have further questions, you can always ask them in the comments too. Until then, thank you very much for watching. And remember, only you can prevent forest fires and diesel fumes. Ugh. Hey, uh, it still appears to be leaking. Oh yeah, I'll be back for this beauty later.